Assalamu alaikum and good day everyone. This is Inflammatory Diseases of the Gastrointestinal Tract, Part 1, which will cover the topics of reflux, esophagitis and acute appendicitis. My name is Dr. Mardiana Abdulaziz from the Department of Pathology of UITM. At the end of Part 1 of this lecture, you should be able to describe the etiology, pathogenesis, morphological features, uh, the clinical manifestations in complications of reflux, esophagitis, as well as acute appendicitis. And skill-wise, you should be able to identify the morphological features, both gross and microscopic, of acute appendicitis. So let's start with reflux esophagitis. Reflux esophagitis falls under the umbrella of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So depending on whether you are using the UK spelling or the American spelling, you may abbreviate it to either G-O-R-D or G-E-R-D, um, but it refers to the same thing. And what it is, is it refers to the clinical condition which arises as a consequence of reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus. Uh, the refluxate or the gastric content can overcome the defensive properties of the esophagus, which include the type of mucosa, which is the stratified squamous epithelium, uh, as well as the various mechanisms of acid clearance, which are normally present at that site. So it is this imbalance between the um, injurious um, action of the gastric content uh, and also the, the, the defensive properties of the esophagus. So this imbalance lead to injury um, to the esophagus. And so as you know, the stratified squamous epithelium of the esophagus is ma made to withstand friction but not acid. So it is very sensitive to gastric acid. Um, the, therefore, prolonged injury to gastric acid can lead to injury and also elicit inflammation. Um, and that gives rise to reflux esophagitis. So in the esophagus, so as you know, when you eat, food passes through your mouth, down to the esophagus, into the stomach. It's supposed to be a one-way street, okay? So it shouldn't really go back up, um, essentially. And this is kept in check by the normal anatomy and also uh, some physiological function of the various structures um, at that site and that includes an intact diaphragm which uh, kind of keeps your esophagus up above the diaphragm and the stomach below the diaphragm and then you have this uh, physiological lower esophageal sphincter which kind of constricts or closes as well as relaxes uh, transiently um, to allow you know food passes through etc so in the normal setting when the lower esophageal closes, then the gastric contents will remain in the stomach. Okay, so the, the door is closed, so you can't really go back up. Um, but when the lower esophageal sphincter opens, then the door is open, so gastric content can reflux upwards into the lower esophagus. So the pathogenesis of gastroesophageal reflux disease or reflux esophagitis um, is really dependent on the decreased lower esophageal tone uh, with or without an increase in abdominal pressure, uh, which then allows gastric juices to reflux into the lower esophagus. So decrease in lower esophageal tone, as we mentioned earlier, will allow um, gastric content to move upwards, and an increase in intra-abdominal pressure will, of course, push the gastric content upwards as well. And in the setting of an open sphincter, then the uh, substance or the gastric content has um, a free way going up into the esophagus and that leads to reflux. So there are several conditions which are associated with the development of gastroesophageal reflux disease. There's a long list of them um, and they exert um, the, the increased risk uh, via either causing a decrease in lower esophageal sphincter tone or causing an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, for example, conditions such as obesity, um, pregnancy, or increase in gastric volume, obviously, will increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and certain medications such as CNS depressants um, or hiatus hernia, which is a condition where part of the stomach herniates upwards, 
uh, via the diaphragmatic orifice can lead to a, a decrease in lower esophageal sphincter tone or sort of a, a decreased um, efficacy of the lower esophageal sphincter tone. And this allows um, gastric content to reflux uh, upwards, as you can see in this image here. Increase in intra-abdominal pressure um, can also be as a result of certain postures such as bending um, uh, or if someone wears tight-fitting clothes, uh, straining, for example, this can also lead to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and um, lead to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Morphologically, esophagitis uh, manifests as redness. As you can see here, these are endoscopic images. Uh, the white, uh, slightly pinkish mucosa here is the stratified squamous epithelium, but you can see these large areas um, of redness or erythema, um, which is often seen in inflammation as a result um, of um, increased in blood flow, also can be as a result of ulcer or erosion. Um, so this is what you see um, grossly in esophagitis. In severe cases, uh, you can get ulceration. And in this case, for example, uh, shown by the arrows here, you have this whitish or creamy substance depositing on the surface of the mucosa. This is fibrin, uh, fibrinoprolent exudate, which is often seen in severe inflammation because of marked increase in vascular permeability. Microscopically, um, reflux esophagitis um, shows squamous hyperplasia, so thickening of the epithelium. If you compare this to the normal esophagus on the top left, okay, so this is markedly thickened. And if you zoom into the epithelium uh, as well as the lamina propria, you'll find that there is an increase in inflammatory cell infiltrate, um, which can be neutrophilic in nature, which can be eosinophils, um, and can also be of mononuclear cells as well. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or reflux esophagitis are often seen in older individuals. The typical complaints are heartburn, dysphagia, um, and regurgitation of gastric content. So this leads to a kind of a sour taste in the mouth. Um, often uh, this comes about postprandial, so after food, especially after heavy meals or when lying supine or lying flat. Okay, so this is partly due to gravity because um, when someone is standing or sitting upright, then gravity sort of helps prevent uh, reflux of gastric contents upwards into the lower esophagus. But when you're lying flat, flat or lying supine, then this function of the gravity is pretty much lost or not very efficient. Uh, there are several complications that can be seen in uh, reflux esophagitis or reflux disease in general. The first one is ulceration because reflux of acid can erode the mucosa, uh, causes inflammation, and when there is severe reflux, you can get epithelial necrosis, therefore loss of the mucosa, and that leads to an ulceration. Complication number two is bleeding, and that can um, manifest as either hematemesis, so vomiting up blood, or melina, which is passing blood through uh, perrectally. Uh, and this is due to erosion of the vessels near areas of inflammation, uh, especially if there is erosion or ulceration uh, of the lower esophagus. So erosion of these vessels um, leading to oozing up of uh, blood and leading to hemorrhage, which can come out either from the top or the tail. Okay, and complication number three is stricture. Um, and this is a consequence of chronic inflammation, uh, perhaps with the presence of mucosal ulceration. Um, as you know, chronic inflammation tends to heal by fibrosis, and fibrosis can lead to stricture and uh, narrowing of the lumen of the esophagus. Complication number four is Barrett's esophagus, which uh, results uh, from prolonged acid exposure. The normal esophageal lining is of stratified squamous epithelium, which is not made to withstand acid. So with this prolonged acid exposure, there needs to be an adaptation. Um, Therefore, there is metaplasia from stratified squamous to glandular epithelium to withstand acid better. And fifth 
uh, complication is the development of esophageal dysplasia and carcinoma uh, as a consequence of Barrett's esophagus. So this is uncommon, um, but this can happen, but they will be discussed in the lecture of esophageal uh, neoplasm. Okay, so here's just an image of Barrett esophagus. So this is the lower esophagus and it is often seen as salmon pink patches extending from the lower esophagus going upwards. And under the microscope, um, this is what your normal esophageal lining should be, stratified squamous epithelium, but it has been partially replaced by glandular epithelium with the presence of goblet cells. So for um, the topic reflux esophagitis, the references are Robin's basic pathology, Underwood's pathology, as well as uh, up-to-date pathophysiology of reflux esophagitis, mainly for the clinical manifestations. Okay, now we move on to appendicitis. Okay, so the appendix, as you know, is an organ um, located in the right lower quadrant just off your cecum. Um, appendicitis refers to inflammation of the appendix, which is common, um, more often seen in adolescents and young adults, but can actually occur in any age group. It is an urgent condition, so it can present as an acute abdomen, so it needs urgent attention. The etiology of appendicitis relates to luminal obstruction, okay? And luminal obstruction can be a result of um, several things, such as fecal stasis, uh, fecalith, lymphoid hyperplasia, um, parasites, uh, especially if you're in the eastern countries, um, presence of foreign bodies um, or neoplasms, okay? So the pathogenesis starts with luminal obstruction, which uh, in one arm here leads to increase in intraluminal pressure, which can compress the appendiceal veins, causing venous outflow obstruction. And that subsequently leads to appendiceal wall ischemia and loss of epithelial integrity. So on the other hand, Obstruction also leads to stasis of the luminal content. So as you know, stool contents include millions and billions of bacteria. So some of these can proliferate in, this, in the setting of stasis. And the combination of bacterial proliferation and loss of epithelial integrity uh, allows these bacteria to invade into the appendiceal wall and elicit an inflammatory reaction. The morphology of acute appendicitis reflects um, all the changes that occur in inflammation. Okay, so what do we see? First of all, the blue arrows show you the presence of fibrinous exudate coating the serosal surface of the appendix. Okay, so fibrin um, deposits there uh, because there is an increase in vascular permeability um, leading to exudation of fibrinogen which deposits as fibrin. The wall of the appendix is also congested, okay, so it looks much darker um, and a little bit more kind of brownish in appearance here, congested because there is vasodilation and increase in vascular uh, flow to the area of inflammation. And within the mucosal lining, there is often ulceration as well as fibrin exudate um, depositing there too. And in general, the appendix is actually larger than normal because of the presence of edema or swelling. Microscopically, um, this is what you see. So this is a cross-section of the appendix and this box here has been magnified to show you the changes. So here is the lumen. Here is a lumen of the appendix and you have a little bit of intact glandular epithelium but much of the epithelium is now lost because of ulceration. Um, there is exudate in the lumen as well as a dense neutrophilic infiltrate which is transmural which means that the infiltrate is present um, all the way from the mucosa and all the way to the serosa. So that's transmural infiltration of neutrophils. Here's another section um, to show you that there is mucosal ulceration and extensive um, 
fibrin and purulent exudate, so exudate rich in leukocytes and leukocyte debris within the lumen. A couple of other images to show you ulceration. So here's intact epithelium and here the epithelium is lost. So there is a mucosal defect here replaced by neutrophils and fibrin exudate. So this is ulceration. And here's another example to show you that there is intact epithelium or mucosa here. So here the mucosa is lost and replaced by sheets and sheets of leukocyte, exudate and fibrin. So this is also ulceration. Patients often present with abdominal pain, which is described as beginning in the peri-umbilical or epigastric area, which then migrates to the right lower quadrant. There is often associated nausea, anorexia, vomiting, low-grade fever. Um, they can also present with uh, diarrhea or constipation, uh, which is a bit more uncommon. On examination, the typical findings are rebound tenderness, um, right lower quadrant tenderness, pain on percussion, uh, rigidity and guarding may be seen in the setting of uh, associated peritonitis. And if you do blood tests, then patients um, also typically have leukocytosis. So that's elevated white cell count as part of the systemic effect of inflammation. So complications of acute appendicitis include perforation. Um, and if you have perforation, then you can get... Um, Complications from perforation such as peritonitis, um, you can get septicemia. And if you recall in the pathogenesis that um, appendicitis is often related to luminal obstruction. So if there is luminal obstruction, chronic luminal obstruction, then um, mucus substance can build up inside the lumen of the appendix um, and lead to mucus retention or mucosal. And management of acute appendicitis is essentially removal of the appendix. Okay, does appendix have a purpose? Maybe I don't know. All right, so that's um, the end of the topic acute appendicitis, and the references that I use for that um, were Robin's Basic Pathology, the tenth edition, and Underwood's Pathology, seventh edition. Thank you very much. So see you in part two of the lecture.